Hello and welcome to a little reading vlog for Hilary Mantel's The Mirror and the Light. So I got hold of this last night, so the 4th of March um, at, what time was that? About 8 o'clock in the evening. Um, my mum and I, um, Ros from Scally Dantling about the books, as you may have seen, went to a signing event at Waterstones in Piccadilly. Um, for the treat of, of getting our hands on this. Um, at that point, I hadn't yet finished bringing up the bodies, so I finished that on the train on the way home, and I started reading this on the train, which I didn't film any of, because I hadn't had the thought yet that it might be interesting to do a vlog. Um, but today is my day off, and I'm gonna get properly dug in. So, so far I have read 50 pages, um, and this is, of course, the final book in her series uh, about Thomas Cromwell, um, which we have been discussing through the wonderful Cromwell on. Um, so, so far in the first 50 pages, we have revisited some of the events of the very end of Bring Up the Bodies. Um, so, obviously, spoilers for Bring Up the Bodies. Um, so, the execution of Abilene and the immediate aftermath of that. Um, and then we've started looking at what happens after that. Um, and one of the things I'm noticing is, well firstly that some of the events have been slightly adjusted, um, I'm imagining that in the years in between she just had to tweak things slightly, um, that's fine with me, I don't have a problem with that, um, particularly if they're adjusted in ways that I can think that maybe um, the last time she just it was just that we only got a partial view of the scene or something. It carries on very fluidly, aside from those little tweaks, it carries on very fluidly from bringing up the bodies, you almost wouldn't know that there was a huge gap in between them. Um, but one of the things I'm noticing is, like, Cromwell is just at it again, and he is just constantly scheming. He's always running, like, multiple parallel possibilities in his head. So he's running, deals with the French ambassador and with Chapuis, the imperial ambassador, um, and he's running uh, teams with one set of friends and another set of friends. When I say friends, I mean kind of like allies in the in the various conflicts around the king. Um, so he's always running these, these, these multiple um, parallel methods, but obviously we know what's going to happen at the end of this, and I'm just wondering, you know, what's going to happen when those um, parallel tracks um, either become blocked or, or actually collide. Um, and the other thing that we're getting a lot of references to is um, Cromwell's ability to defend himself. So um, there's been talk about how his house is built, his, his house at Austin Friars, um, and how there are ways that you can... Um, stab someone through the door or something like there's slits so that you can shoot someone who's standing outside the door um and then there's also further defenses at the far end at there's the outside gate defenses and then there's defenses at the door of the house um and his cook thurston asks like why is it necessary to have a set of defenses at your gate and at your door and Cromwell replies well in these times you know someone could change from your friend to, to your enemy in the time it takes them to walk across the courtyard um so that's the level of threat that he perceives um he also carries a knife and he says that he carries a knife purely because he can't work out a situation in which he would need to use it so you know he needs to have the knife because he's not sure um of all of the possible eventualities um and I, yeah, I'm so curious for the ending of this book and like how how that's going to pan out. Like, is Cromwell going to use these violent tendencies that it's often been suggested that he has? Um, is he going to try to defend himself? Um, because, you know, we know what's going to happen in the end and it doesn't end very well for Cromwell. Um, but yeah, so we will see. It is a 900 page long book. It is an absolute behemoth. Um, I can't remember the last time I read a book even nearly this long. Um, of course, it's March of the Mammoths this month, um, and March of the Mammoths is all about reading a book. I think the criteria is over 600 pages, so this is like a book and a half's worth um, of a March of the Mammoths book. Um, but yeah, I will try and... Caught my hair in the book there. I'll try and just like generally keep you a little bit updated on my thoughts as I read. Um, starting from now, I'm currently in chapter two, which is called Salvage. Oh, and also, this is my copy that I got signed for me, which seems like unbelievably selfish to get something all for myself. Um, but Bo hasn't read these yet, and he said, just get it for you because it's your thing. Um, she said, Matilda, all good wishes from Hilary Mantel. I'm really curious, actually, because in the book she is very crisp and precise when it comes to um, describing people and describing enough of their appearance for you to get a really clear idea of what the person is like, and she does that frequently and repeatedly with characters that come up again and again, like Anne Boleyn. Um, and I just have to wonder how she would describe herself. 
Um, this is the thought that struck me as we were kind of like looking at her as we came around. Um, and like what features she would pick out as being her like defining characteristics um, in the way that like with Anne, she frequently talks about her eyes, but also later on in the books about her like boniness. And yeah, and one thing that I'm realising is that I have characters that I particularly like having scenes with. I don't like really having the scenes with the ambassadors. I find it maybe a little bit like it's still good, but it, it's not what is drawing me into the book. And I really like scenes with Jane Seymour. I love her as a character. And yeah, I'm worried for her too. And I'm also worried for how that is going to impact on Cromwell, because I think Cromwell really likes Jane Seymour. So I think he's going to mourn quite hard. Um, and a lot of people are going to be very upset um, when things go wrong for Jane. Um, and again, you know, it's not a spoiler, it's English history. <laughs> um, yeah, and also thinking about um, Anne Boleyn and, you know, how, how swiftly and easily she was beheaded. I was just wondering how she would feel and how her family would feel about the way that she's remembered now. Um, and it's like that every English school child knows divorced beheaded died, divorced beheaded survived. And that's that's the rhyme that they know. This is this is how everyone remembers um, Henry VIII's six wives, and Anne is just reduced to that one word, beheaded. Um, I mean, you could argue for all of them, they're all reduced to one word. Um, but yeah, after everything that she did and all of the impact that she had, she was just, she's, she, the, the, the key thing that she is remembered for is her death. Um, so yeah, so time to start reading. This is a little passage that I find quite interesting. He's thinking about how to persuade Mary to be on the, well, to get along with the king again, basically. Um, he thinks the cardinal would have known best how to manage this. Wolsey always said, work out what people want, and you might be able to offer it. It is not always what you think, and may be cheap to supply. It didn't work with Thomas More. He was a drowning man who struck away the hand stretched to save him. Offer after offer was made, and More took none. The age of persuasion has ended, as far as Henry is concerned. It ended the day more dripped to the, to the scaffold to drown in blood and rainwater. Now we live in the age of coercion, where the king's will is an instrument reshaped each morning as if by a master forger, sharp-pointed, biting, it spirals deep into our crooked age. You will see Henry, profound in deception, take an ambassador's arm and charm him. Lying gives him a deep and subtle pleasure, so deep and subtle he does not know he is lying. He thinks he is the most truthful of princes. I like the idea of that. The age of persuasion is over and the age of coercion has begun. And what does that mean for Cromwell? Because he has always been um, the king of the art of persuasion and um, bringing people into uh, uh, yeah into agreement with him or... Sh or um, uh, putting a gentle pressure on them to enable them to see things from his point of view. And I guess um, that's the idea of coercion, is, is where he's, instead of gently encouraging people to agree with him, he is doing it a little bit more forcefully and at more of a personal risk because you have to show your hand a little bit more. Um, so yeah, so I like that little uh, uh, paragraph there. I think this um, was why I was thinking about Anne, Anne thinking about herself as being called, um, as being known as beheaded. Um, that a reference to Anne before she dies, saying that she will be known hereafter as Anne the Headless, um, and she's not known as Anne the Headless because, yeah, we we don't even give her those three words. We just give her beheaded half of the time. So yeah. Anyway. Oh, indeed, the next line. Poor woman, Risley says. I doubt she will be known at all. This chapter is as long as some books.
morning. It is Saturday morning and I'm trying to crack on through the book. Um, so just a little update, um, just like a momentary comment, really. Um, I'm just over page 100, so I'm a ninth of the way through this um, absolute mammoth um, of a book. And Henry has just said, a man who cannot control his wife is not fit to serve his country. And I just had to chuckle. I think Mandel is, is great for little uh, humorous moments like that. Evening readers, it's now Sunday evening and I'm very shortly going to be heading into work again for my last of three night shifts. So I haven't read as much as I thought I would have done on these nights because I've had other things to do um, on my breaks. Um, but I've got up to page 150, which is a sixth of the way through the book. Um, and what I want to say is that I'm really, I'm, I'm terrified for Cromwell. I, I really am. And just everything that he does, um, I feel like he's juggling with knives. And up until now, it's going really, really smoothly. But now he's just starting to like fumble with them. And I'm worried that he's not going to be able to keep up. And we're hearing him say things that we know and he knows. He has had people beheaded for saying less um, in terms of talking about, you know, things that might happen when the king dies. He's speaking treason, like, knowingly, um, and he's saying this to people that he can't necessarily trust, um, or in places where maybe he thinks that he's secure from outsiders or um, people untrustworthy e eavesdropping, um, when he isn't necessarily. And I think we know that Cromwell has got spies in every household, and, you know, we get, in this section, we get some references to him um, going to visit the, the young, um, I was going to say princesses, but the king's daughters, who are not currently classed as princesses. Um, and, you know, he's got a servant that, Matthew, that used to work for him, working there under a different name. Um, but he seems to not sufficiently acknowledge that the same thing will be happening to him. And I just have to wonder, like, who is duplicitous in, in Cromwell's household? Because there's got to be someone. Um, because I read the biography of Henry VIII, I do know the name of one person who Cromwell, broadly speaking, trusts, who later turns against him. But I'm not going to spoil that for anyone who doesn't have that little bit of English history knowledge. But at the moment, I'm really suspicious of Christophe. So Christophe is this um, French thief, um, that Cromwell kind of took in and, and he uses him as like a bit of a kind of a bodyguard that people underestimate because he's just like a, a French ruffian and people don't get him. Um, and I'm just thinking, on the one hand, he seems to trust Cromwell because he has worked with him for such a long time and Cromwell brought him from the streets of Calais and turned him into, um, you know, a person with a job and something to represent. Um, but on the other hand, he, at, at, at his heart of heart, he's a thief. Um, and I don't mean that in an unforgiving way. Um, I just mean that if somebody has made him a better offer, um, then he might well be adapting to that. Um, so at the moment, I have, have my suspicions for um, Christoph, and I'm worried about the things that he's listening to. But I'm sure there are other characters um, that possibly aren't entirely reliable. Um, so yeah, it's very interesting. I want to see more of the female characters. I want to see more of Mary. I want to see more of Jane. Like, Jane got married to the king and then she disappeared. And that makes me very sad because she's always been a character that I particularly like. So I'm hoping that she will re-emerge sometime soon. I mean, she's going to have to re-emerge pregnant at some point. Um, based on, you know, knowledge of English history. Um, and I really, yeah, I want to see some more of her. Um, and, yeah, I think... I never thought I would find a scene of a king's, like a Tudor king's council um, debating, you know, relatively minor matters to be gripping, but it is, it is engaging. I don't think it's as engaging at the moment as the previous books have been. I don't know whether it's because it's so heavy and I'm on night shifts and, you know, I've said again and again, this does affect my attitude to things that I read. Um, but I'm, I'm intrigued by the way that things are starting to, they feel like they're starting to fall to pieces. So I've talked about Cromwell with his knives juggling, but we've also got Henry VIII, who is, he's literally physically falling to pieces. He's got a leg ulcer that is just constantly oozing pus, um, which is like, it's a gift to the author in terms of symbolism, isn't it? Like, you, you, I mean, she didn't make it up. It's true. Um, but it, it works really well in terms of um, thinking about like, Henry gradually losing his grip on the situation and also it makes sense of him as a character in that 
he's constantly in pain and he's constantly got this unexplained um disorder going on as somebody who has always been terrified of ill health and um she's made that very clear throughout the series that henry's main fear um is being ill um so yeah so so there's that to kind of build on and that to develop as the as the plot continues good afternoon it's tuesday afternoon and i'm just around about over page 200 220 ish um apologies for the weird position i'm on the sofa with the cat um, and both of us, are, well, I was just about to say both of us are too comfortable to move, but, um, she's deserted me already. Um, and I just read a really, a scene filled with threat, um, and kind of, I've, I've lost the word at the moment, but, um, a very dark scene, um, retrospectively looking back at when, Cromwell was getting the king to sign the death warrants for the men who were convicted alongside Anne and at the time in Bring Up the Bodies that scene doesn't occur we don't directly see that um, but in Cromwell's memory uh, it's it's really quite um, menacing um, and Cromwell is Cromwell standing on one side of the king and Rafe Sadler is standing on the other and they're both giving each other looks of like you know the king has to sign these documents and there's almost movements or motions from the king that he has some kind of sentiment of wishing to be merciful like he references to the young age of some of the the of, of Francis Weston um who's one of the accused and Cromwell and Rafe between them don't give him any encouragement towards mercy so they are very much in control of the situation and very much in control of um you know coercing the king slightly to encourage him to be um perhaps more violent than he would have been inclined to be um and it talks about how he struggles to sign his name to the papers that are going to you know cause the deaths of the men who are his friends and it's interesting because um in the last couple of pages um, there have also been references to Cromwell perhaps being less sure that his judgment at that time um, was correct and that we're less sure that he did the right thing at that phase. So we're getting this idea of doubt that Cromwell has and that potentially the king has as well um, about the actions that they've taken over the course of the last year. Um, and I feel like that's where some of the threat against Cromwell is going to have. One of the things that I've been meaning to mention um, in this previously, and I did mention it um, in a comment in a video about bring up the bodies, um, is just how much the dead are very much present characters not just in this book but throughout the series like from the time of um cardinal wolsey's death um and also cromwell's father's death um but going on now we've got more and more dead characters um who i mean in in the first pages of this there's like a, a character guide and uh one section of the character guide they're all divided into like which family they're from the very first section is the recently dead i'll see if i can very clumsily turn this around to show you Somewhere on there it says the recently dead. Yeah, like, they're, they're characters who have opinions on current events. Like, they, Cromwell is constantly thinking, oh, you know, what would Moore say uh, in this situation? And um, they're very much present, like, physically in rooms. Like, they might, for instance, walk past rooms that, that somebody was in and, and he'll reference to almost like a lingering smell of that person or um, just things like that, really, that, that the dead continue to be present um in a way that is it, it's like i think hillary mantel has an, an interest in the idea of ghosts and i think there are ghosts in this book that are very much they're not haunting ghosts they're ghosts that are in, that are in people's minds um that people can't kind of forget them and lay them to rest um so yeah so i find that quite interesting um and obviously we get the feeling that these um these ghosts are going to come back and um do some damage um and that they haven't you know that that section is not over um just because those people are dead um and there's going to continue to be repercussions from that anyway thank you very much for listening and i will speak to you soon um when i get to maybe about page 300 then i'm going to stop this section okay bye hello good morning it's now wednesday morning and i've just finished
part one. And part one ends with a bit of a recollection of a moment in the past. And what strikes me, or what struck me as I read it, was I was thinking, we've been back to this scene quite a few times. And then I realised that that's a technique that Hilary Mantel is quite frequently em employing throughout all three of the books, which is that there are certain moments in Cromwell's past that are, in a way, turning points for him, um, and moments that are very important to him as a character and uh, that feature very prominently in his recollections, um, that he keeps going back to. And every time she tells you about this scene, there's possibly just something slightly different. She's not repeating word for word the things that she's said before about this scene, but she is interpreting that old scene in the light of things that are happening at the moment. So the scene that, that ends part one of this book is a scene from very near the beginning of the original um, Wolf Hall, um, which is when the Cardinal has been kind of cast from grace and there is a point when Henry Norris rides to give him a letter from the King and the Cardinal falls to his knees in the mud and it is a very moving scene in which a man who has become um, possibly far too proud um, suddenly humbles himself in a way that is to a certain extent ridiculous. Um, and that is that ridiculousness of the scene, as well as the kind of tragedy of it, is an element that is played up again and again um, in terms of the way that different characters um, react and interpret to the, the, the news that the Cardinal has, you know, kneeled down in the mud. Um, and certain people use it throughout the, the series as ammunition to kind of laugh at him. Um, so, yeah, so it makes me wonder, like, why why this scene? And there are other scenes as well. Um, for instance, the first one that comes to mind at the moment is the, the very first scene in the books where Cromwell is um, kind of abused by his father um, and like uh, hit as quite a young boy. And that's the, the kind of the instigating point that causes him to set out on his journey that eventually leads him to where he is now. Um, and that's, again, a point that it comes under reinterpretation when we find out that um, his father actually... Um, beat him up but also acted to protect him from some of the consequences of a fight that he had been involved in earlier on in that day so we get this idea that that the scene wasn't exactly what it seemed on the first impression and and it's this idea that there are multiple layers to all of these um events and interactions and and sometimes things only come out years after the event and i think that's part of what Hilary Mantel has set out to do with this book is to look at kind of the layers of history and the secrets of history that continue to be unlocked um, years and indeed centuries after the events. And um, it doesn't matter necessarily that those those details are strictly accurate because it's all about how you kind of see them and interpret them. Anyway, that was just a thought I had as I was finishing part one. I think I'm going to read the next chapter um, today, hopefully, which is Augmentation, um, the start of part two, and then I will possibly edit this together and post it. So let me know if you've had any thoughts um, and if, if that idea of, of events that keep cropping up um, in Cromwell's memory um, makes sense to you and if there are any moments that you would highlight as being that kind of moment that, that comes up again and again in the book, I would be interested to be reminded of the others. Hello again, it's later in the same day and I am just over a third, just under, sorry, a third of the way through The Mirror and the Light. I've just finished the chapter Augmentation and I think I'm going to stop there um, and maybe divide this into three kind of chunks, um, like one for each week in the latter part of March, if I finish this in March. Um, I re I've really enjoyed it. It's been a really good start to the book, um, but it is the length of another book and I'm finding myself craving um, reading something else, um, whether it's a reread. I kind of quite fancy reading um, Pride and Prejudice for some reason, um, or also I really want to read some Agatha Christie's. Um, so I might just read something that is not The Mirror and the Light for a little while, just to kind of refresh myself. Um, the same as at the end of the first book, um, plot-wise, sometimes it's not entirely like really pacey. So yeah, I think just something refreshing would help. Anyway, thank you very much for watching and talk to me in the comments.